We live in a chemical world. Cleaning products, pharmaceuticals, paints and pesticides contain some of the 80,000 chemicals that now permeate our homes, our bodies and our environment. It's hard to imagine our lives without them, but studies are continually finding ever more compelling evidence of the harmful and long-lasting effects of some of these compounds. These products can be found all around us, at work, in our homes, our gardens. In this episode, we're going to investigate what the problems are with these household chemicals, and we're going to explore the solutions. Alchemy, metallurgy, potions and powders. This was chemistry for most of our history. But the Industrial Revolution, war, and the population explosion that followed gave rise to a chemical industry, now worth almost four trillion euro worldwide annually. Exposure to a combination and accumulation of chemicals has been linked to an increased risk of cancer impaired childhood development, and even harm to our reproductive systems. In the environment, chemicals bioaccumulate. Soils get degraded and our waters get polluted. Here, in Ireland, we've seen this cause intersex in fish. Millions of litres of household cleaning products, garden pesticides, DIY solvents and paints are bought in Ireland every year. Substantial quantities and their contaminated containers are improperly disposed of, permeating our environment and causing lasting damage. In an attempt to combat this, local authorities organise special hazardous waste collection days. And I'm here in Carlo to learn more. Tell us about the open days. Okay, so these are special one-day events where we encourage the public to bring in household hazardous waste and we will take them from them and ensure that they're disposed of correctly. And because they're hazardous, it's very expensive for us to treat them and dispose of them. So with all of these products here have a label to show that they're hazardous? Yes, Duncan. So as you can see here on the bleach one, we have irritant and this traditional symbol of the cross um, showing that it is um, a hazardous material. And then we can see here we have on this one, again, the same one that we looked at a moment ago, that it's harmful to aquatic environments. And then because of the way it's packaged, it's also extremely flammable because it's in an aerosol tin. Right, so these are two very common ones. One is the, this is flammable. Yeah. And then this is one showing it's harmful to aquatic organisms. Are these producers giving clear enough information? to warn people of the damage these can be doing? Well, I think they provide information. It's up to the individual whether they take it on board or not. And that is the difficulty, isn't it? That it, it is probably some effort to read that. So possibly some people will and some people won't. Uh, and that is a difficulty. If it was right up at the front, maybe you wouldn't purchase the item in the beginning. Maybe you'd look for something different. A lot of household cleaning materials and DIY products are all new inventions. Just going back 40, 50 years ago, there were far fewer materials available for you to clean your home or decorate your home. Now you walk into any supermarket or DIY store and there are shelves upon shelves of material. We're bombarded by advertising messages to go out and purchase more items and we don't need all those things. So if we stop and think, do a small bit of research or reading on how to be more environmentally friendly in the home and in the garden, we can reduce the amount of chemicals that we currently depend on, and we can also save ourselves some money by doing that. In spite of the efforts of local authorities around the country, an estimated 30,000 tonnes of hazardous material is incorrectly or illegally disposed of in Ireland each year. But even with the proper disposal of these hazardous materials, 
there is still a significant cost to the taxpayer. I'm on my way to the Ballymun Rediscovery Centre, where a more imaginative approach to eliminate this waste stream is being explored. Here, they reuse and repurpose all sorts of household products that would otherwise be treated as waste. Jared Griffin runs the paint rediscovery section here. Jared, if somebody's buying paint, yes. what sort of tips would you give them? Okay, first of all, uh, assess, your, assess your job and make sure you're buying the right quantity of paint for the job. How do you know that, by the way? Well, th there are charts on the back of the, you know, the colour charts you get. They'll give you sizes, you measure the wall, it'll tell you how many litres to buy per, per square metre. If you look at these, these, these here, you know, somebody has bought this, this can of paint and used, like, very little out of it. First thing to, for is please, there are no hazardous symbols in this, especially here for where it says clean with water, and there's no, there's, uh, so this is definitely a water-based paint, and no hazardous symbols on the, on the container either. Right, so, so that's all important. Non-hazardous water-based paint. Right. If you have paint left over, give it to your friends to, to, to use if they, if, they, if they want to use it, or bring it to your recycled centre. Reuse it, and then the end, recycle it. And do you think we'd save an awful lot of paint by this? Save the environment, save the, save the rivers. I want to go fishing. I want to, I'm want. i a fly fisherman. I want to fish. I want to catch salmon. I want to catch trout. I want our rivers clean. Jared explains that the centre take in leftover paint, mix new colours, repackage and resell at heavily discounted prices. You can actually buy from here oh, rather than buy from... Absolutely, right, from, 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 a, from a retail store, yes. I mean, and the, that's the, that's the, a huge reduction in massive buying new paint. Money. We give people huge value for money here. We can, we can charge uh, 30 euros for 50 litres of paint. So it's only 10% of the price it's, it's, you buy here? Absolutely. It's, really? It's a huge saving, yeah. yeah it is, it's brilliant. Oh, good work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Roman. Thank you. Good to see you. The Rediscovery Centre is proving that the waste, or the improper disposal of many products, could easily become a thing of the past. As well as impacts on the environment, many common household chemicals also pose a major risk to human health. For example, many studies have found that the regular use of chemical household cleaning products can as much as double the incidence of asthma and respiratory problems of the users. Airmid Help Group specialise in testing the effectiveness and safety of household hazardous materials. Dr. Bruce Mitchell is consultant immunologist at Blackrock Clinic and also CEO of Airmid. Bruce, there are a lot of chemicals that we're using in our homes today. You know, are these doing damage or are they all important for us to be using? I think, Duncan, everything is, is relative and if you use things in an incorrect manner, they can do harm. And if you use them in a correct manner, they're beneficial. But are we abusing these chemicals? I think a lot of us don't know how to use them and don't recognise that there can be risks with some. And you see that many, many times when people are overexposed to these chemicals. The way we use certain uh, elements, we spray them. If you're spraying them, they're going into your airways. You've got to understand that. There is actually a big plume of droplets getting up into the air. You're now breathing them. If you put your head into the oven as you were cleaning the inside of the oven with the oven cleaner, you would get a toxic load of exposure. And I've actually seen that with one of my patients some years back. Who is most vulnerable? I think you would start with those who are actually using the products. And for a lot of what they do, they should wear masks and gloves and whatnot. Uh, then you have those who have asthma or who have chronic respiratory disease or chronic skin diseases. And then you have the, uh, the newborn babies whose immune systems are yet to be developed and those early years of life as your immune system evolves. Very often there are warning signs on the back of the products. Yes. You know, are they clear enough? I mean, if you think about what they did with cigarettes and what they're now doing with alcohol, they're going to be, put big labels on the front of the bottles or the cigarette packs. That's how you get the message across to people. This can be damaging. Something on the back that uh, most of us don't read, that can be quite difficult to interpret. 
So what do some of these mean? I mean, sodium hypochlorite is quite a potent chemical. So you don't want to be uh, exposing your skin or your airway to this in any way. So you need ventilation as you're using it. Of course, it's a bleach. And bleach, as we know, say professional cleaners, we know that long-term consequences of repeated chronic exposures occur. And we should be very careful about limiting our exposures where at all possible. The health concerns surrounding chemical cleaners have given rise to a renewed interest in homemade natural cleaning products. At Airmed Labs, we've asked them to test one of these DIY cleaners against a more typical store-bought brand. So Duncan, if you see our um, Petri dishes here, uh, we've performed a number of bacteria studies where we've applied Staphylococcus aureus uh, to our Petri dish and we put the cleaning product on the Petri dish and we're going to measure um, the effectiveness of, uh, of, uh, of the antimicrobial effect of each cleaning product. So what do you mean by Staphylo... Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus yeah, Caucus it's a difficult is. word, but Caucus. it's it's a bacteria that's commonly associated with um, infections in hospitals. We have this daily shower spray, which was bought store bought, and we did the same technique. We've applied the daily shower spray to the well of the agar plate, and what we see is not really having an impact on the the staph aureus. Right, because there's very little change there, isn't there? Precisely, yes. And this is a product that you buy in the shop. Exactly. It's meant to do this. Yep. So what we have here is a homemade product, which actually does have an impact on um, uh, the, the Staphylococcus aureus. Our homemade shower, uh, bathroom cleaner did work. Right. So it can be very successful. It's much cheaper to produce. Exactly. Homemade one. Homemade one. Really. It's surprising to see just how effective this homemade cleaner is. In part two, we'll explore if it's possible to go chemical free in the home and the garden. I'm in Roscommon, where the local authorities, in a bid to reduce the use of harmful chemicals countywide, created the role of Green Cleaning Ambassador. But how practical is it to replace the use of chemical cleaning products with natural alternatives? Michelle Fallon is Roscommon County Council's Green Cleaning Ambassador. In this new role, she makes and tests homemade natural alternative cleaning products. At her home, Michelle shared some of the secrets of her trade. Hello. Hi, Michelle. You're very welcome. Pleased to meet you. You too. This is a beautiful part of Roscommon, isn't oh, it? Oh, thank Lovely you. Here. It is. Come on in. Why do you think this is important? I would be um, asthmatic and suffer with sinuses. So I was doing a lot of reading up about, you know, chemicals like bleach and things like that and how it can affect your breathing and they have so many chemicals in them, like the carcinogenic and everything. So I started looking at, you know, doing some green cleaning products, as they're called, and that's really how it started. And now I'm just on a roll. The products that you produce, though, mm -hmm. are they going to work as well? as the ones that you buy in the shops. Some of them work even better than shop-bought ones. And they're better for the environment, they're better for cleaning. In fact, my health is better as a result of it. I wouldn't say now that's, you know, the cure of it all, but I definitely um, don't have all the sort of wheeziness. Like if I was using bleach, I would have to have all the windows open and everything and I'd be like wheezy. Michelle talked me through a number of recipes for homemade cleaners. Let's get started. So what we want to do is we want a cup of white vinegar out there if you want. But can a few basic ingredients like lemon juice, white vinegar, baking soda in the right mix rival the brand name cleaners? Okay. These are reacting with each other, is it? There's only one way to find out. <laughs> a very good job there, Duncan. What do you think? I'm quite impressed. I Would think you... I'd have you back again. I have to say, the product's brilliant. Yeah. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. They're perfect for cleaning. Yeah. And I love the scent. Yeah, the scent is lovely and it get, brings up a lovely shine on the floor and everything. So I think I've won you over. You can learn more about Michelle's green cleaning life hacks 
on the Roscommon County Council website. So that's the indoors, but what about our gardens? The quest for that perfect manicured garden often involves harmful chemicals. The problem is many common garden chemicals can damage soil, earthworms and threaten biodiversity. But are there alternatives? Is there a more natural, less damaging approach to gardening? To find out, I've come to the Parscourt Estate, home to one of the most perfect historic gardens in the world. Peter Dowtel is a celebrity gardener who advocates for a more natural approach to gardening. So I asked him for some tips. Peter, for householders now and gardeners trying to avoid using pesticides and herbicides, you know, what should they look out for? Well, the most common problem in gardens, Duncan, and in fact, there you see it, it's, it's slug damage, slug and snail. You see the holes there. Even in the middle of the winter, slugs and snails are out there causing damage, and it's the most common problem for Irish gardens. And there are many, many ways, obviously, of how you deal with that then, but unfortunately, what most of us do to control slugs and snails as we go and get the cheapest, nastiest slug pellets that we can get in the shop. And I refer to them as cheap and nasty because they, they, the active ingredient is a thing called methaldehyde, which is a formulation of alcohol, which as well as killing the slugs and snails, is also toxic to the birds and to the hedgehogs, the predators of them, the problem in the first place. Right, and the birds and the hedgehogs are the ones that cure the problem. And we're putting out a, a pellet that is going to kill them. That's terrible. It's ludicrous. Yeah. Now, there are other alternatives, there are many other alternatives, I'm glad to say. One of them is a kind of a DIY product, and as the fella says, here's one I prepared earlier. It's an old yoghurt container, and what I'm going to do with it, I've cut little holes here in it, but what I'm going to do with it, if you were wondering why I was walking around with a bottle of beer in my yeah, pocket. Yeah, a little bit suspicious, I thought. You were yeah. far too polite but yeah. to ask. Yeah. I'm going to fill this with the beer, I'm going to bury it in the soil. Okay. I'll fill it with soil up to here, so that the slugs and snails can get in. They'll drown and die happy, I hope, in the beer but there's a lid on it now, so it's, they're not available. The dead slugs aren't available to the birds or to the hedgehogs. And what draws the slugs to this in the first place? It's the, the smell of the alcohol. It'll, it'll attract every slug in the parish to this old really? yogurt container. So they just swarm in on this? Yes, and they, really? they, they'll drown, they can't get out, and they, right. they'll die in it. Right, I'll just bring it up. I don't want to go too high with the beer, Duncan, because they, yeah. can, they might actually get out again. Okay. Do you know what I mean? You. So keep it yeah, down a bit. Keep so it down a bit so they can't get out. So that's it. So the lid is on it then. It's not available to the predators. But there are many other options as well, or several other options right. available in the control of slugs. Well, I'll show good. you a few of them there. You have a bag of tricks there, I see. Yeah. I'll show you a few of them. Very good. So if all that seems like a bit too much work, and it yeah. isn't really a bit too much work, but you can go and get a, a slug pellet. If you look for one here that contains the active ingredient ferric phosphate, mm -hmm. okay, that is just as effective in the control of slugs but it's not toxic to the predators. It's not going to harm the birds or the hedgehogs. And if a bird or a hedgehog does manage to get a slug that has been killed by this pellet, it's not going to harm it. Right, and right. it's not a hazardous material either, is it? No, no, unfortunately you still do have the plastic packaging to, to deal yeah. with, but you don't have any chemical residue or anything like that, no. Are there other solutions now? There are, so you just want to, to, to protect a particular pot. Yeah. This is a, a copper tape, so it's basically sticky tape on one side and then copper on the other side. Thanks. This appeals to me. I don't know what that says about me, right. but you know that you know the saliva that the the slug excretes as it's moving. You know that yes, trail that it leaves behind. Yeah, yeah. Well, that reacts with the copper to give it a little mini electric shock. Oh wow! And it pushes the slug off. The slug can't cross it. And it's really in small areas that you can do this. Yes, yeah. it's just as I say, something like a raised bed. Because if you leave a gap, if I if I left a gap there, yeah. the slug will just find the gap and get through it. Right. So in a bigger area, you know, it's, it's not going to be cost effective. It's not going to be practical. Mm. Well, any pot at all right. that you work on. So the slugs the slug can, can still be there then for for hedgehogs or for birds Absolutely. too. Absolutely, you know? it, it it goes back to real basics, Duncan. It's nature starts to work for itself again. So you've got a healthy supply of the food for the birds and for the hedgehogs, uh, which in time will control the slug problem. It's not going to happen overnight, you know that, but as the, the bird population increases, if you're lucky enough to, to have a garden that can take hedgehogs, uh, th then you're going to increase their numbers and they're going to feed off the slugs and sails and, and you're left with undamaged that, That's a great solution. Oh, it's brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. absolutely. Brilliant. Peter's approach is one that gardeners right across the country could easily emulate. 
Responsible for these majestic Parscourt gardens is head gardener Alex Slazinger. Alex shares a similar philosophy, favouring a more natural approach. One that he's determined to implement in these historic gardens. And it's great that the family, you know, that you, one of the Slazingers, has actually now taken over as head gardener. Yeah. It true. must be a really challenging job. It though. is, it's very challenging. We have a, a big responsibility here to continue on a lot of the work that's been going on really for the last 350 years. And have you reduced over the years the amount of, say, harmful chemicals? Yes, we have. We've reduced it probably about 20 to 25 percent since the time that I've been here. So that's in my current position. That's over the last three years. Uh, and that would just really be using alternative products, also doing a lot more hands-on physical uh, actually work. So, you know, get out there and rather than spraying uh, the weeds, actually get out there and, and dig them up. Absolutely. So I'm dying to go exploring. Yeah. Where Brilliant. should we start? Well, I think what we'll do is we'll start in the rose garden and the herbaceous border. You see here, these are actually all old English roses uh, that were planted in 1976 by my grandmother. Um, 41 years ago. 41 years ago, yeah. So this will be something now that I, I will start to, you know, phase out some of these old English roses and start bringing in some new uh, varieties. And I think the great thing about that is it's the advancements in the sort of the science and the breeding of the roses that you can get more disease resistant roses now as well. Um, which will reduce kind of our need for spraying as well. And less chemicals. And less chemicals, and that's the key. And can, I mean, you, can you actually kind of do this now without any kind of glyphosate or... Absolutely, yeah. Nicanoids? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the point is, is um, you just get out there, get on your hands and knees and dig up the weeds. Reducing that amount of chemicals, we're also getting a lot more insects uh, over the last couple of years. Just by reducing that one chemical with the roses, you notice that you're getting more bees in here. Right. You're getting more insects, more activity going on as well. Really and it's actually, it's fantastic. lovely to see that. Yeah. And you know, people will start noticing that in their own garden as well. So what's ahead of us here now? Uh, so this is the double herbaceous border. This is the longest double herbaceous border in the country. The longest one in the country? They're 122 metres long. This is very labour intensive kind of area. So we don't use any chemicals in this part of the garden. Right. That's really good. Yeah. So this must be really good for bird life and for it insects. It is. It's, <clears throat> it's brilliant. This all kicks off in kind of early spring uh, where we have a tulip festival. We have daffodils popping up. Then by the sort of the middle of the summer, everything here is a complete impact of wildlife. Um, there's a bumblebees, there's honeybees here as well. Uh, there's a lot of butterflies, a lot of different kind of, kind of insects. And you're basically submerged in nature when you're in here. Right, and that's because you have no use of chemicals here Absolutely, at all. Absolutely, yeah. That's fantastic. But there must be an awful lot of work goes into it. This is, this is constant work. Today, we're only just starting to realise the impacts that man-made chemicals have on the natural world and human health. However, there are many practical steps we can all take to reduce our exposure to harmful chemicals and lessen the damage we're causing to our environment and to ourselves.